Okay, today will be the uh, first lecture um, for the second uh, third of the course, and we're going to take a little bit different uh, approach uh, for this, at least for this lecture and for the next few. Uh, rather than focusing on processes and specific groups of organisms, we're going to be focusing on uh, broad patterns and the distribution of organisms in the oceans. Um, and that comes under the general title of biodiversity. Um, but before I begin and talk about all that, I uh, just want to point out um, that uh, perhaps your brain is getting a bit full with all the uh, stuff that we've been talking about so far. Um, I'd like to assure you that the uh, second test will be based on the second third of the course. And so you can do a brain dump. Well, actually, I don't hope you I hope you don't do a brain dump of all the things you learned. Uh, but unless there's something uh, specific that we refer to and, and, and talk about during the second uh, third of the course, um, there will be nothing uh, uh, on that uh, on that first third uh, on the second test. So um, so but I don't uh, recommend that you use this excuse that your brain is full if you want to leave the lecture or their discussion, because if you look at the size of this, the student's uh, head, probably not something that you want to be associated with. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned, biodiversity and why that matters, why species matters. Um, also, we're going to talk about um, some new approaches um, uh, for looking at these organisms. Uh, I, I put new here, but really these things have been used for at least 10 years, um, if not longer, um, but they may be new to you. Um, and then we'll end with some uh, discussion about general patterns of diversity um, around the globe. The, the, uh, the material that I use for making up this lecture, uh, well, you can see here, um, in addition to Leviton and Miller, which we've uh, touched on and used before, um, I took um, a couple things from uh, uh, the textbook that you, uh, some of you who took uh, Mass 314, which is a comparative um, ecology of uh, marine and uh, terrestrial ecosystems. I took a few things from that, um, and so I put the relevant um, sections on Sakai, uh, so so you can get that. And if you happen to have sold that textbook, if you took the course, um, notice that it's going to it's in two pieces because Sakai doesn't allow you to uh, to upload very large files. So uh, so look for the two sections of, of those page of those uh, that section of the textbook okay so let's start off um, for those who did take um, um, mass 314 uh, some of this is, is, is going to be a review um, but uh, I think uh, it's worthwhile going over just make sure what's on the same page so when we use this word diversity um, you have to be careful about how it's used because it's used um, it, with different um, aspects in mind and different definitions and different uh, parts of it. Um, perhaps the simplest one is, is, is the number of species um, that are present in a, in a system. And, uh, and that's, of course, simply uh, species uh, richness. Uh, but another aspect of diversity um, is, is evenness. Um, that is, the, whether there's more of one type of, of, of organism versus another. And then a final uh, use of the word is, is really uh, just the types of organisms present um, in a habitat, not necessarily the numbers or even how even they are. So again, um, you have to be very uh, careful about how that word is used uh, and look at the context of its use to, to figure out exactly what the author is talking about. Um, a very common method uh, for measuring um, diversity or, or, or to quantify it is called the Shannon Index. These are other words and people's names that are associated with that index, but in fact, um, uh, those two other guys um, had nothing to do with it. Um, no, I don't expect you to memorize this equation, um, but what is important to note is that this index, unlike other ones, include both aspects of diversity, both species richness and evenness. Now, may, you may wonder why evenness um, uh, 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 should be included. Um, but if you just think about our everyday use of the word, um, and you think about the, uh, the, the racial mate, uh, make, uh, makeup of some states in, 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 the, in this country, think about Maine. Uh, well, Maine is about 95% Caucasian, uh, very few 
uh, people of color in, in Maine. And then you think about um, some place down in, in the South, Mississippi or Alabama or some one of those places. Uh, I think everyone would agree that um, those Southern states are much more racially diverse than Maine. And, and the same idea is basically um, uh, applied to, uh, to when we think about um, biological communities and consider com two communi communities, A and B. You can see that the species richness is exactly the same. That is, the number of species is the same. But community B is much more even. In fact, it's perfectly even compare, compared to community A. And I can't remember if I actually uh, made sure that the numbers of organisms are the same in both of them. But um, that's, that, that's uh, not really a, a factor in calculating this. Anyway, the, the Shannon index, uh, which is, for whatever reason, is always abbreviated as H, um, uh, indicates that it, it includes, even though that they have the same number of species, um, community B is more um, diverse because it's more even than community A. Okay, so let's, uh, let's you know, we, I often like to begin why we should care about this, and, and so now let's get to that. Why, why care about diversity? Um, and this would be a good question to ask in, in a more in a live setting where I could get your reactions because I'm, I would be kind of curious and I'd like to hear more about this when we talk about this lecture. But I, I need to give you the answers now, at least what I think are some of the answers. And, and some of them are, are you know, I think um, uh, you, you would know already. Um, there are just some organisms, uh, the whales and dolphins and so on, that people like. And this gets back to basically, you know, the types of organisms that are present, that aspect of diversity, not necessarily the numbers of organisms. Um, so that's one reason why people care about uh, diversity. Um, another one is, again, you know, basically, again, why we study marine biology. Uh, there are very many useful things, fish and so on, that we get from the oceans. And diversity has some, aspect, has some relationship to that. Um, and so that's some, some of the things that we get from the oceans. Um, there's a more general way in, in which to talk about diversity, and that's ecosystem services. Basically, what the ecosystem is doing for us as a society. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of discussion about how diversity has an impact or not um, on ecosystem services. You know, what's the value of having a, an estuary, a diverse estuary, versus not a diverse estuary? And that estuary, um, in, in our case, the Delaware estuary, um, does very many things for us. Um, uh, besides providing food, it provides a, a conduit for shipping um, from, from Philadelphia and other cities, uh, Delaware City, to places around the world. So that's another ecosystem service of the Delaware Estuary. And so there are questions about the relationship between diversity and ecosystem services. Big debate about that. Um, lots of work done in the microbial world. Uh, and basically, I would say the message is, um, more diversity, better, um, whatever you're looking at. Um, and that's been true not only for microbes, but also for fisheries. Um, this particular study argued that um, more diverse uh, food webs led to more productive uh, fisheries. Um, as I uh, look at that, I realize that this is kind of in, in, in uh, contradiction to what we talked about with terms of trophic transfer, where we argued that the open oceans um, do not have productive uh, fisheries, mainly because they don't have high prior production, but secondly, because of their food chain is very, very complex. And because of the um, loss due, due to the various steps in that food chain and the cumulative impact of trophic transfer, um, there is less prior production that can make its way up to the fish. Um, this would argue, and the study uh, uh, showed that there's in fact more diversity leads to more productive fisheries. And then, of course, there's the other work finding just the opposite, where more diversity over time led to uh, 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 less productive fisheries. And here, the, the, one argument is you know, just what I mentioned about the trophic transfer argument, but also what may be going on here, um, and I can't remember exactly the specifics of the study, but you can imagine, for example, uh, bluefin tuna, um, if that is fished out and so that um, so that um, that fish no longer is really dominant, they may allow more predators of perhaps smaller size to take over the uh, e ecological niche that was uh, occupied by the bluefin tuna. So that the end result, um, because of overfishing of bluefin tuna, um, has allowed diversity to increase. And so there could be the... Uh, um, uh, uh, 
uh, relationship there. So, so those smaller predators take over from the um, from the uh, bluefin tuna and have a negative impact on the fisheries. So anyway, the, the, the bottom line here is not so much this, the specifics of any of these studies, but rather that there is this big discussion about diversity and its relationship to ecosystem services. And it gets into why we should care about diversity and preserve it. So, but another argument could be made is that we should care about organisms. I, I, I guess I should pose as a question. Do, should we care about organisms if they don't have a, uh, any economic value, regardless of their economic value? Um, and I think we do intrinsically, I, I, I hope, um, that you would say, yeah, just, just because we can't put a dollar sign to an organism, that doesn't mean we can wipe it out. Um, and, and there's actually a word for that. It's called biophilia. And, and, and it's our bond between us and other things. That we think there's something wrong. I, I hope you, you think there's something wrong about just kind of going out and wantonly destroying um, another organism. Um, and and um, uh, it, although small kids and me included, you know, used to use uh, magnifying glasses to uh, burn up ants. Um, in some ways, you know, as an adult, that'd be pretty silly to do. Uh, but also, I think now uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, yeah, not the right thing to do. Um, anyway, this biophilia hypothesis um, first kind of came from a, 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 a psychologist, a sociologist, um, who wrote this uh, book called Art of Living. Uh, it was a thin little book. I think I read it when I was in high school. But it really took off uh, 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 through the work of an uh, ecologist, E.O. Wilson, who's, who's still around, really old guy now. Um, who wrote many interesting books and, and, um, and papers. He's known mainly for being an ant ecologist. Um, uh, the ants won the Pulitzer Prize uh, a few years ago. Uh, he's also infamous for uh, his involvement in a, in a, in a, uh, in a uh, set of hypotheses about um, uh, human interactions being um, governed by um, um, basically biology, uh, kind of controversy that's died down now. Uh, the Naturalist is a great book. It's his autobiography, basically. A really wonderful book to read. I really highly recommend it. But I bring it up now because um, of another book he wrote called Biophilia. And he and he's a big proponent now uh, of preserving diversity um, throughout the biosphere. And again, it's, it's um, this connection that we have uh, with the rest of, of, of life on the planet. Okay, and then finally... Um, uh, last year, there was a series on or a show on uh, PBS uh, called Of Ants and Men. I just checked; you can see it um, and get a, uh, see it on on on, uh, on the web uh, via that link if you're interested. Okay, so uh, we talked about the number of species, and uh, but we left undefined what the heck that is, and perhaps you've encountered this before. Uh, but let's uh, make sure everyone again uh, knows about these very important topics. Um, why does it matter? Again, you know, why should I care? Uh, let's point out that um, that many of our laws are based on what a species actually is, uh, one being the Endangered Species Act. Um, one example of this is this panther that's down in Florida. And and uh, if there's a specific or a, uh, a separate species of, of Florida panther, um, it's very much endangered. But if that Florida panther is considered just be one of, of a, you know, kind of a, uh, uh, just a, uh, you know, an example of, of a subpopulation of, of panthers that are found elsewhere, then it's not endangered. Um, the same argument has been um, put forward for the polar bears. If polar bears, there's some um, speculation that polar bears are just basically a, a, um, a, uh, uh, a uh, variety of, of grizzly bears. Um, and so if that's the case, then we don't have to worry about the polar bears going extinct because there's plenty of grizzly bears in Alaska on land. So anyway, the point here is, is that it very much matters what, uh, how we define a species for in case of uh, uh, cons conservation laws. More scientifically, uh, many ideas in ecology um, uh, really re revolve on species. And in fact, uh, one definition of a species, ecological definition, is basically it's what um, defines a niche. And so there's very much a, a correspondence and re tight relationship between those two concepts. Hard to talk about competition um, for limited uh, resources and competition for a niche without 
um, having some idea of what a species is. So what is a species? The, the, the answer um, that's often given is what's called the biological species concept. And basically it's a group of organisms capable of mating um, and, and not only mating, but also producing fertile offspring. That is their offspring can also mate. So there are examples of organisms that can mate, um, but they cannot produce uh, fertile offspring. Now the, the person who came up with this idea was Ernst Meyer. Um, you can see when he lived, not, you know, not that, I guess, not that long ago. Um, I actually saw him as a graduate student uh, walking around um, uh, um, in Harvard Yard um, in Cambridge. Um, and just, just a few words about Ernst Meyer, kind of an uh, incredible figure. He was originally from Germany, um, but moved to this country, I think, back in the 1930s. Uh, and his, his most influential uh, book, uh, where he came up with the idea of a species, is, is the one indicated there. Uh, published in 1942, but I, I, I want to mention, uh, bring, bring him up not only because of that book and because, but, but because of the fact that he was um, uh, really active until nearly uh, the day he died. And one of his last books, as you can see here, was published just a year before he died in, in, in 2005. Um, and in fact, he had a career after he, uh, you know, uh, nominally retired in 65. I'm not sure exactly if he turned 60, if he retired when he was 65. Uh, but in any case, um, you can see that he had uh, published more articles and certainly books than many, many people uh, uh, have published during their entire career. And he did, he basically had a career um, that, that uh, succeeded, um, or exceeded many others uh, over many more years. So just an incredible and productive uh, scientist. So, uh, so, uh, so species, again, is organisms that are, are a group of organisms, population of organisms capable of uh, not only mating, but also producing fertile offspring. So, okay, um, what are the problems with this definition? If you think back, you know, sorry, I, I told you you could dump your, your brain of all the things we, you learned during the first third of the course, but now go to the floor or the trash bin or wherever you put all that stuff and, and find and remember again um, the different types of organisms we encountered last uh, the first third and and you probably remember that many of the, the microbes are are asexual that is they don't um, uh, reproduce uh, by sexual uh, processes um, and and so so there right there um, so are there no microbial species uh, well, by this definition, um, uh, well, you couldn't define them by that definition, basically. And then another problem is, is you know, okay, so let's suppose that they have a sexual um, uh, life cycle. Uh, how would you be able to get that to actually test it um, and, and, and see whether or not their offspring are viable? Viable in the sense of, again, that they are, uh, in turn, are able to produce offspring, not so much that they are alive, but that they are um, able to uh, reproduce. So big problems. I mean, you think about some, we're going to see an example in a minute of, of killer whales. How would you get killer whales um, uh, to uh, capture enough killer whales to, to test this idea? So even with big organisms, it's a problem. And in fact, it's an old problem. You can see here Charlie Dar Darwin back in the 19th century uh, pointed out that he, he didn't want to go there and talk about the definition of a species. Um, no definition has, has, has yet satisfied all naturalists. Yet every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he speaks of a species. Kind of reminds me of the definition of pornography. It's really hard to define, and, and the Supreme Court justice is really famous for saying that he couldn't define pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. And that's what uh, Darwin is basically saying. And Miller um, is a little bit more cynical, basically says, says the same thing. A species is whatever a competent, recognized system, systemicist says it is. So if, in other words, if enough of people get together and call it a species, that's a species. That's being a little bit too cynical. Um, there are other ways to define species, not well, um, well agreed upon or agreed upon by all, all um, but it's not just, just this. I think that's a bit too cynical. Anyway, we're going to go forward um, and, and talk and use this word species, even though it's a little bit hard to define. Now, the traditional way of, of, of basically defining species and looking at organisms and saying one, whether one organism is different from another, is basically you look at it. You're looking at the visible traits, the phenotypes. Sometimes 
by visible, I mean you may need a microscope. Uh, you may need an electron microscope to count the hairs on various zooplankton, which is literally what some of the zooplankton taxonomists have to do. But basically, that's the idea, that you can see these things. And the word that's sometimes used to describe these types of organisms are mor morpho species. That is, if two organisms look the same, they belong to the same morpho species. If they look different, then they belong to different morpho species. Um, that's kind of a practical way of, of going about things because often that's all you can do. Um, but if you think about it, it's going to get us into problems. Um, this is one example, microbial example, where this, um, these three pictures here show the same diatom. And, and we know that because we can grow it in pure culture and we can see these different morphologies form depending on how, how it's, it, it grows. And, and you also already know um, another example that you probably didn't think about it. Think about some of the life cycles of, say, some of the uh, crustaceans. Um, and one and a blue crab is one example. Um, the blue crab adult looks very, very different from its megalope and its uh, you know, juvenile stages in the plankton. You know, again, this is an example of meroplankton. So we know that, uh, that this is the same species, even though it looks very, very different. So there's one problem with using phenotype. Um, and then we have the other problem with organisms that may look very, very similar, in fact, exactly the same, um, but there's a possibility that they, in fact, belong to different species. Um, and I might talk about the, the microbes here. Um, you can probably guess that all these little dots, um, which, you know, remember that this is a, a epifluorescence um, uh, micrograph of bacteria stained for their DNA, and each of these little dots here are, is a bacterium. And um, you can probably guess that they don't belong to um, the same species. Um, a little bit harder, perhaps, or perhaps a bit more surprising, is the possibility that not, not all of these uh, uh, killer whales belong to the same species. So uh, although all of, if they're swimming together like that, they probably do belong to the same species. But we're going to look at, in a minute at a a study that looked at the different types of killer whales around um, the world. So how do we do that? If, if, if we have organisms that, that look different, may belong to the same species, in other case, organisms that look the same, but may uh, belong to the same uh, different species. And one, one um, solution to that problem is to use DNA. And that's the modern um, solution. And that's a, the newest kind of thing that I alluded to at the beginning of, of this lecture. Um, and so basically, um, you look at, um, uh, you can look at their whole genome. Um, that's being done increasingly so as uh, costs decrease. Um, but what's, what's much more common is to use only one gene that we'll call a taxonomic marker or phylogenetic marker uh, for, uh, for uh, distinguishing among organisms. Um, and so what's making this possible and much more, more and more common is that the cost of sequencing has, has decreased substantially um, over time. And just to give you some idea about this, it was a big deal back um, when I first got here to Delaware to, to sequence a gene. You can see the cost there. Uh, fast forward 10 years, um, 2000 was the year that the draft genome uh, of us, the humans, was uh, published in Science and Nature. Uh, and you can see the cost had already decreased by 100 fold about five dollars per gene now today and this is still um, you know a little bit dated now six years old you can see the cost has decreased substantially here's another graph um, showing the cost to sequence our our genome um, over time you can see you now this is seventy thousand dollars here and now up to today uh, well this this is now a year old so it's probably gone down a little bit it's gone down to uh, uh, roughly a thousand a couple thousand dollars um, per our per our genome the question is should you get your genome sequence you know there's a possibility in, in the near future perhaps maybe not you but your kids will have their genome sequence as a kind of their first um first physical um, you know once you get a sequence that's it you know it's not going to change although if you have a tumor grow you may have that tumor uh, sequence to see how what genetic change has occurred and why it's developed into a tumor um, and so that may be really important to help prevent disease, head off diseases. It raises some ethical questions about, you know, do you really want to know the answer? 
uh, I don't think you want to let the insurance companies know the answer. Uh, it may give you give some insights into your life expectancy and what type of diseases that you may encounter um, over your lifetime. So there's a big debate about about this whole question, and and this is you know of, of course outside the uh, the, uh, the this course to talk about all that. The point I want to make here though is is because of this huge huge interest in our genome and and the genome of larger organisms, we can use that technology and and uh, to look at marine organisms. Um, and the fact that this has become much easier to do because of all this int interest in, um, in biomedicine. So the modern molecular approach for looking at these, these killer whales is to basically extract their DNA. And, and again, you could sequence that directly, get some genomic information from that. But much more common is to use a polymerase chain reaction and to get one gene out of that. This one gene that's informative about the types of organisms that you're dealing with. And then usually um, analyzed by sequencing. Now, there are other approaches for analyzing the, res the, the PCR product. Um, we're not going to get into that, um, those methods. Um, the, the modern method, though, is just a sequence because, again, it's gotten so cheap and easy to do that. So, um, so you don't know PCR, the difference between PCR and DNA. Um, I have a, a, a lecture about this that I recorded last year. In fact, I listened to it. Um, you know, about 10 minutes or so before I got sick of it. Um, and I decided it's, it's, it's fine. It's good enough for you this year. You know, all these lectures I re-record, uh, re even though I, I did it last year because, I, you know, there are things that change, things I want to improve. Uh, but this one I thought was, was fine. And so if you don't know what these things are, or if you want to, if you don't know what this is, um, I highly recommend that you look at that recording of that lecture, which is now on YouTube at the, at the mass, uh, at, at what is, what's the course now for mass 420, 424, right? So anyway, that's, that, it's there as, as the, as is the PowerPoint that I used to, to do the lecture on Sakai. So I'm not going to go into more detail about that, uh, about those methods and uh, about PCR. You should know the basics of PCR and what, what you need to do PCR and, and the outcome of PCR, even though you may not know exactly how it works. Okay, so what are taxonomic marker genes? There's lots of them, but there's only two that, that you have to know for this course. Um, one is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, and the other is a gene for a uh, cytochrome oxidase 1, CO1. That um, these organisms, these genes uh, are found in, um, in bacteria. They're found just in the bacteria, but they're found in mitochondria because they're involved in. Well, the cytochrome oxidase one is involved in respiration, um, and um, and so both of these genes are found in mitochondria. So again, you know why mitochondria are is a place where um, energy is made in all organisms, um, all eukaryotic organisms, and these mitochondria have DNA because you remember they come from um, via the endosymbiotic hypothesis uh, from bacteria. So they all have DNA and they all have these two genes. So so they're found in all organisms. Um, all organisms have mitochondria. So they're simple. They don't have introns. Eukaryotes um, have really complicated gene structure um, that makes it difficult to look at the D DNA directly. Um, that's not the case with mitochondrial DNA because basically it's a it's bacterial DNA. Um, what's also crucial is it has regions that vary from highly conserved to, to uh, highly variable. And the uh, and the other um, lecture that I just mentioned here explains why that's important. Why it's important to have both highly conserved and highly variable regions for doing the PCR. So uh, I want to emphasize uh, and highlight uh, the cytochrome oxidase one gene. Um, because it's used for the Barcode of Life project, which is um, a project to just categorize different types of marine organisms around the world by just um, doing this uh, fairly uh, simple sequencing of that one gene. Um, and this review um, is written by Ann Bakalin, who actually used to be a professor here um, uh, down in, in, in located down here at Lewis. So they, anyway, the, the CO1 gene is the um, gene of choice for the barcode of life for categorizing on diversity of marine organisms. 
So one drawback of these genes um, is that they're um, that they're for only for distant related organisms, um, and we can get some idea for how distant related they are by by having some other means for for um, category uh, for calibrating um, the differences in in sequences. So basically, more differences between sequences means that there's more evolutionary time separating those organisms. Now the, the trick is what's the relationship, um, and and the molecular clock idea basically says there is a relationship. It actually doesn't really have to be a linear one, but there is a relationship, and it doesn't change over time. And so you, you again you calibrate that by taking sequences from organisms that you know from the fossil record and have some other independent method for looking at how old they are, and then you and you reconstruct um, that relationship between time and sequence differences. And, and they're very old. So you can see here, we see differences only a, uh, on the order of a few genes, and, we, and it, it, it translates into millions of years. So, so for some of the things um, in some um, evolutionary relationships, we, we need to look at other genes um, to look at uh, more closely related, related organisms that um, diverge from one another by only thousands of years. Um, for example, looking at the difference between um, even the uh, gorillas and, and humans, um, these genes are not real good because we, we evolved from those um, larger um, apes uh, much uh, more uh, uh, recently than this. Uh, but it is good for looking at other problems. So let's um, get just a touch into um, how this is done. And, and because we're going to be using trees to look at a couple problems in a minute. So these trees, although they can be built up by phenotypic data, they're generally built up and built um, and constructed using sequence data. And basically the first step is to calculate the difference in the sequences um, between two organisms. Um, this is called the dissimilatory uh, the, the um, uh, uh, matrix. Basically it's a genetic difference, difference between organisms, again defined by the differences in sequences. Then there's some magic in making the tree. We're not going to get into that. Um, and then um, what's important to, to realize is, it, is, a, is the uh, distance along the branch is the real important thing. Not the distance this way, not the, not the distance horizontally, but rather the branch. And so to go from D to E, you don't go this way. You have to go and calculate the distance along the branches to figure out how distantly related or not. Uh, uh, two organisms are. Okay, so let's look at an example um, of, of such a tree. Um, this is a tree looking at various uh, fiddler crabs um, and, and their distribution of, uh, around, the, around the world. Um, these numbers here are what's called bootstrap values. Um, it's one uh, measure of how reliable the tree is. These trees um, have some uncertainty about them. Um, it's based not only on the method that uh, was used to construct a tree, but also the quality and the amount of sequence data are available for defining the differences among the organisms. So high numbers means it's really uh, good and high probability. Basically 100 means it's, um, uh, one way to think about this is, is that if you built this tree 100 times, how many times would you see this kind of type of construction? So anything, you know, all these numbers are pretty high. This one, of course, looks rather low, only 53 percent of the time this came out um, uh, that way. So that uh, raises a little bit of question whether that's a, a correct or not. But for the most part, we see high numbers here. Anyway, the point here is that we can use um, these sequence differences to talk about the, the, you know, the relationship among these different organisms. And we see that there's these different um, uh, 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 types of organisms and their location in in, you know, on this uh, hemisphere versus elsewhere. And because these organisms uh, are only linked via the deepest uh, branch to the others, uh, we can deduce that these must be the ancestral clade um, that gave rise to the other organisms. Okay, so let's get to another um, application. And, and this is this question I raised earlier about here we have two um, organisms, or really seems to be one organism, killer whales, um, orcas, um, that, you know, they look the same, but in fact, are they the same? And, 
And uh, the the um, the study that looked at this question didn't did not use a taxonomic gene. Rather, they used the complete uh, sequence of the mitochondria. So as I mentioned, that's becoming more and more common. It's just to use much more of the genomic and uh, mitochondrial genome. Look at the whole thing because um, the, there's that much more information, um, and um, and it's becoming easier and easier to do. And and the upshot, we're, we're not going to get into details of this, is in fact, although the organisms look the same down in the Southern Ocean and the ones that occur um, off the coast of, of Alaska, um, they are in fact different um, species even, and there are also other subspecies of these of these animals. So the, again, the details are not that important for you to remember that there are three species of killer whales, but rather the fact that you can use this a genomic information or mitochondrial genomic information to look at these organisms and deduce differences among them. Okay, so um, so you, I do, uh, in spite of the fact that um, mitochondrial uh, genomes are being used increasingly so and genomic DNA increasingly so for deducing um, differences among organisms, it is important to know that there are these taxonomic marker genes that are used very, quite, uh, very frequently um, with the help of PCR um, to look at differences among organisms. It doesn't really solve the species problem. It basically um, translates the species problem into a, 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 a difference in sequence. And at some point, you just say, well, this is a species. Um, in, um, for 16S, it's 97% similarity, and 95% is genus, and so on. You can make those um, um, you know, draw those analogies or comparisons between traditional taxonomic names and the sequence sequences uh, sequence differences, uh, but often we don't. We just talk about the differences in species, uh, differences in the sequences, and not worry about uh, whether it's a genus or not. Anyway, all that's become impossible because sequencing is becoming really cheap and, and easy to do. Easy in the sense that you basically isolate the DNA, do the PCR. And you just send it off to a, a company or a, a sequencing center, and they do all the hard work. Now, that doesn't mean your work is done, though, because there's a lot of work that is needed to be done to um, analyze those data. And that whole field is called bioinformatics. That's a word I, I want you to remember. Bioinformatics, um, big field these days in analyzing sequence. And finally, um, we start off by talking about some of the links between diversity and ecosystem services. Okay, another use of, uh, of, of molecular tools is to look at an invasive species. So invasive species is basically, as you may guess, something that's not, doesn't belong there. Um, it's not lived there previously. Um, there's some arguments that basically it's a little bit of, a, of our, our bias that we um, are just not used to these organisms being in an area. There are time scales too short that given enough time, um, an organism will eventually get there. But certainly, um, often it creates problems when we have organisms that we have uh, uh, facilitated to move from one, or one, one region of the, of the world to another. Um, that can cause problems. And there's some evidence indicating that these invasions are, are becoming more and more common as time goes on, as, become, as the world becomes more and more connected via uh, global trade. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so we can use DNA um, sequence information to to talk and look at this problem and to figure out you know where they came from, and so basically the idea is, is pretty simple that the you know if if you, so now we're looking at species the same species and let's let's just kind of agree that we know what that means, um, and and now we we're looking for differences within that species in sequences, and so the basic idea is that the same species in different regions will have some difference in sequence. So even though they're the same species, they still will differ um, uh, enough that we can see that. And so when we see two organisms with the same sequence, we, we would deduce that they came from the same region. So you can see, I, I hope that this kind of gives us a handle about looking at an invader and where it came from. And an example here that's from uh, Leventon is invasion of, of uh, polychaetes from uh, from actually this coast to European waters. And we can see here this the sequence similarities um, group the organisms that are found in the North Sea, um, Netherlands, Scotland, and Denmark, with those that are found in 
some in our waters and also in Massachusetts. So the deduction is that the North Sea worms came from uh, Massachusetts and Delaware. Um, so the question is, well, I, I, was, I was looking at this. How do we know it's not the other way around? How do we know that it didn't come from Europe and invaded our waters? Well, partly we know that because, uh, especially in Europe, um, zoologists have been looking at these places for a long, long time, and then they suddenly see these new um, animals appear. And by, you know, now they can see where they came from. So the other, other, other um, part of the graph indicates um, that the... Uh, <coughs> The worms that are found in the Baltics, Germany, Finland, Lithuania, um, came from Chesapeake Bay and other places along this coast. So again, we can deduce that from looking at these um, by, by these sequences. And so, as I was saying, um, we know the direction by just um, by the fact that we have long-term records in some places to look at the arrival of these organisms. Sometimes the sequence information gives us a little bit of a hint um, that it was one way or the other. Um, if there are other differences, but often it's just back, back to basic um, zoology and observations of which organism appeared when. Um, and so just a, a little bit of a side note about invasive species. Um, this one really astounded me when I learned about it. I think I just learned it last year because periwinkles is probably one of the most common snail you see in rocket tidal uh, pools and, and uh, seaweeds. Um, and and Litorina is a really common genus of these organisms. And I was, I was really shocked to hear that they are not native to New England, that they came from Europe uh, probably about 100 years ago. Um, another example is lionfish. Um, and I think we talked about lionfish already in this course. Um, I think that's a, um, uh, uh, a, uh, at least a common name is worthwhile uh, remembering. Um, you can see the, the problem with, uh, that it uh, uh, um, causes. It's a really voracious predator eats all sorts of organisms, and because of its um, spines, it's not um, eaten by other um, fish, at least um, so far. Um, it's found originally in, in the Indo-Pacific, um, and it was uh, either by purpose, that is, someone got sick of having the fish in their aquarium, or just there's another hypothesis that because of one of the hurricanes that hit the coast of Florida, it was just um, accidentally uh, released into local waters there. And since then, it spread. So here's some data about um, lionfish starting back in 1985, uh, located just off of, of uh, I guess that's Miami there. 95, a bit bigger dot, but you can see over time that it's increasing and found increasingly in uh, all over the uh, Caribbean and even as far uh, north as, as our waters. Okay. Um, just a couple more words. There's this website that I found that has all invasive species, 100 worst ones. Um, and you, if you look at that, you can see many marine ones. And another website I came across has listed these five as uh, their top ones. A little bit surprised that lionfish are not there. Um, maybe uh, just their bias, how they um, define worse and the ecological and environmental impact of these invaders. Um, of these, um, Green, green crabs you see in the R waters here. Um, uh, and so I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's probably not that important for you to remember. The only one I, I really think you should know about and, and, and remember is zebra mussel. Um, zebra mussels are originally from um, lakes in southern Russia and were uh, somehow introduced into our waters um, and now are a big problem, especially in the Great Lakes. Um, and the Hudson River uh, is another example that I know of where they cause lots of problems. And the thing is that they're really uh, voracious uh, filter feeders. And they, and they wipe the waters clean of, of phytoplankton, which, you know, in some ways is not too bad um, because a lot of these places are, are, are a little bit uh, eutrophic and have uh, blooms that cause problems. And so the zebra mussel is in some ways a control, but in other places they cause uh, big problems in terms of, of, of uh, clogging up uh, uh, heat conductors for power plants, clog up pipes that uh, want to, that are, are designed to, uh, to pipe in that fresh water. Um, so they, they also cause problems. And of course, if you're a local organism and you're used to eating that phytoplankton, um, you're in big trouble if you have to compete with the zebra mussel. So it's basically a fresh water. It doesn't live in totally marine 
uh, waters, uh, but it is found in brackish waters, and, and apparently it's been found um, in the uh, in the upper parts of the Chesapeake Bay. So of the, all these, I, I think zebra mussel is the one that you should definitely remember. Okay, and let's now end with some um, observations about the uh, uh, patterns of the distribution of organisms on the, on the planet. Um, that's what biogeography is all about. Um, you can talk about the distribution of some of these invasive species and in, in about, say, the you know, why one killer whale is found one place and, and not another. Now we're going to talk about broad patterns and how they differ with latitude and longitude. And one of the most uh, 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 classic observations about in biogeography is the fact that the tropics are more diverse than temperate regions. That's, you may know that already from thinking about um, a tropical forest, which I'm sure you know is really, really diverse compared to a forest and say, well, our, our forest or a forest, a better comparison would be a forest in say the, um, in the uh, Olympic Peninsula of Washington, the state of Washington, which also gets a lot of rain, um, also has big trees and superficially it may look like a tropical forest, but it's much, much less diverse than a, uh, a rainforest in, in the tropics. Well, that uh, observation about the tropics being more diverse than um, temperate regions also holds true for marine organisms. Um, and here's just, you know, uh, Euphalus is our, our old favorite krill. Um, here's another word for you, ostracods, um, another crustacean, probably not important for you to know. To know. Um, I didn't put it in the glossary. Anyway, point is, tropics are more diverse than the um, uh, than temperate regions. Um, just here's another um, piece of data from Leventon about mollusks. Again, the same thing. Different graphs showing now um, kind of north, kind of odd to have the north on the left um, and south on the right. But anyway, again, higher diversity of, uh, of the smallest, uh, uh, even at, uh, at the different uh, taxonomic levels. So it kind of removes the problem of species. We don't have to be exactly, um, you know, you know uh, precise about how we define species because we can see it regardless of how we define it, how we define these different taxonomic levels. Okay, so, um, and here's a more recent study. All the data show so far are fairly old. This study is from now five years old, again, showing higher um, uh, diversity in the, in the tropics at, you know, near the equator and much lower um, at higher latitudes. Um, and, and this graph and table uh, of this study allows me to talk about different, another way of dividing up diversity and that is to talk about alpha diversity, which is basically um, what we've been really talking about so far is the diversity of one location versus gamma diversity, um, which is diversity over a much larger region um, in the entire um, landscape. And then beta diversity is basically the, the ratio of those two, how much diversity varies among uh, locations within that landscape. Um, and I, I found, a, a, I think, a really uh, good way of thinking about this. And again, we think about these locations, say one, two, and three here, and this is being the whole landscape. The alpha diversity would be five, and here diversity um, is just simply uh, species richness. So there's five of these different things here, these geometric shapes in each of the three locations. So the alpha diversity is five. The, the gamma diversity is also five because they're exactly the same in all three of them. So if you look at the whole landscape, there's only five there. And so if we take the ratio of one to the other, we see that's one. And basically what it's saying, there's basically one type of community uh, found in, throughout the landscape. Now the other extreme is, so that's, one, that's what that says. The other extreme is, is basically each of the locations has the same alpha diversity. So each of these things, each of the ge geometric shapes, the number of them is the same in three locations. But if we count up all the places, we can see that there's 15. Each one is totally different from each other. And so we take the, uh, the ratio again, 15 divided by 5 gives us 3. And that is we have basically the maximum possible diversity in terms of beta. The differences among the locations um, is seen in this location, in this, in this uh, situation here. So I hope that gives some better insights into uh, what beta is. I had some, frankly, some problems understanding what beta diversity was and I, th I thought this explained it pretty well. You know, now 
you agree as well. Anyway, so just one final example. Um, uh, you know, is it really as true for benthic? It's uh, the backup. It's true for benthic species that we see um, higher diversity at the lower latitudes versus um, the higher latitudes. Um, perhaps less so for pelagic species, a little bit um, flatter curve than we saw before, but there's still a pattern here. So the question is why? And, and I know that um, you talked a little bit about this already in the comparative um, terrestrial and marine ecosystem course. And I pulled this table from um, your textbook that you used. And I was looking at all these explanations and thinking about um, the way I, th I think about it as a marine biologist. I, I see some similarities between this list and what I'm about to tell you, um, but some differences. And at first I thought about trying to somehow put them all together, but in the end I decided just to go with what I think is most applicable to the oceans. May not be, may not be totally applicable to what happens in terrestrial systems, but the following I think is most uh, useful for thinking about the oceans. So there's, there, these are not necessarily in conflict, but it's just a different way of, 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 uh, of uh, looking at this problem. So, um, so this is based on more of a, of a, a marine biologist perspective as opposed to a terrestrial person. And the Krebs, I'm sure, is more of a terrestrial person, not a marine biologist. So anyway, one one method, uh, one method, one one explanation is is that there's higher production in the tropics versus um, marine systems. In um, in the there's higher production in the tropics than in temperate for marine systems. Well, that that's not the case actually. So that may be the case for for uh, terrestrial systems, but that's this is really not an explanation of what's going on in the ocean. One that's a bit more understandable, in fact, Leviton argues that the, the one thing that correlates the best with diversity is temperature. So the question is, is temperature basically a, a driver of, of the pattern in diversity, or is it just kind of core, core uh, varying? And there's other factors that are really driving diversity. And, and um, Leviton argues for warmer temperatures leading to faster speciation and perhaps it, um, it's because basically things grow faster generally when there's um, uh, 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 warmer temperatures and so there's just more time for speciation to occur um, and we also know that um, that uh, uh, organisms that grow faster are generally smaller that may also help promote um, speciation and then finally, uh, another explanation is stability. Um, yeah, we talked already about how there are no blooms um, in tropical waters um, because of the physical environment is, is more stable. That is the, the bottom up answer to why there are no blooms is the fact that there's no uh, uh, big change in light. And so that means there's no change in uh, the stability of the water column. And that means the nutrient regime is basically the same uh, you know, for the whole year. And so there's quite a bit of work suggesting that the, uh, the stability of the environment allows more time for species to involve, evolve. So with this and many a couple of other explanations, we're going to come uh, uh, across these again. The time stability hypothesis we're going to see when we talk about the deep ocean, because that's one uh, place where it was actually first suggested to explain why the deep ocean, um, the deep uh, the, the benthic environment in the deep ocean is so diverse. So, so to back up, there's there's no single answer for why they're more diverse, why the tropics are more diverse. What I want you to take away from this is that is is this list of answers, and, and be able to uh, to speak to them and 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 talk a little bit about why um, each of these may have some role. Although again, I think prep production doesn't have much role in explain the, the, the variation that we see with latitude. Now, another um, a big um, gradient that we see is between the two oceans. And I know you did not talk about this in um, that course, the comparative ecosystem course. Um, and let's ask, ask the question whether the Pacific Ocean is any diverse or less so than the Atlantic Ocean, and also whether the coasts differ in diversity. And fortunately, we have two places um, on the and on the country to look at this question that that marine biologists have been living at and working at for a long, long time. They include Friday Harbor, which is run by the University of Washington, found on 
in the San Juan in, in the San Juan Islands in Puget Sound, um, and also on the other coast, there's the Woods Hole, um, uh, where there's Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, also the Marine Biology Lab that's found in Woods Hole. Uh, the Marine Biology Lab, MBL, has been there for oh, over 100 years. I'm not sure how long Friday Harbor has been there. Probably not quite as long. But the point is, is that uh, zoologists have been looking at the diversity of, of, of marine invertebrates um, at both places for a long time. And, and basically the answer is Pacific, for the most part, and the West Coast is more diverse than the Atlantic Coast, Atlantic Ocean, and the East Coast. And that's shown here for various types of, of of, um, of, um, of invertebrates, uh, ranging from snails, gastropods, mollusks, starfish, and so on. I guess if I remember correctly, there's yeah here there's these polychaetes that there's the East Coast has a few more polychaetes than um, than different types of polychaetes than the West Coast. But every other case, I believe, yes, every other case, the West Coast has more species within that group. And another big example of the Pacific Ocean now. Um, being more diverse than the Atlantic is corals. And perhaps those of you who are taking Professor Warren's coral ecology course have come across this already. That if we look at the these number of species of corals in, in the Pacific Ocean, basically um, off of uh, uh, Australia um, and Asia, it's much, much higher than what we see in the Caribbean. Um, you can see the numbers there, 150 and, and plus versus 20. So there's a huge difference um, uh, in the number of corals that we find in the two regions. So again, fitting the general uh, trend here, more diversity in the Pacific than in the Atlantic. And again, of course, the obvious answer, a uh, question is why. Um, now, with regard to the corals, um, uh, I, I suspect you're going to talk about this if you haven't already, much more in the coral reef um, ecology course. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about this question as well, probably. I'm not, still not quite sure how much we'll talk about corals in this course, given that many of you are taking Professor Warren's class, um, Warren's class. So, uh, but we'll certainly talk about corals to some extent. Anyway, uh, and so we'll get more into the sp specific case of the corals and, uh, when we come across that, those organisms uh, again later in the course. So let's just back up and just talk more generally about why the Pacific is more uh, diverse than the Atlantic. And, and two uh, reasons that come to mind is basically that the Pacific is bigger. We've talked already a couple times and, um, and emphasized how big the Pacific is compared to the Atlantic. And so there's the idea that diversity increases with area, uh, habitat area. And we'll, we'll again, we're going to revisit this idea and, and, and show um, uh, how it can be used to explain other patterns that we see in diversity around the, in the biosphere. Um, so that's that's one explanation. I think it's probably one of the better ones. Um, another one, though, is uh, again related to this time stability hypothesis. That again, the Pacific is more stable. Um, we see, and this one I'm not quite as sure about. Um, uh, certainly, the tropical Pacific is more stable than the the uh, temperate Atlantic, but that's kind of comparing apples and oranges, isn't it? Um, but anyway. Um, there's some ideas that the Pacific is more stable than the Atlantic to help explain the difference between uh, the, the two oceans. So um, one excuse for not having a better answer for this is a, this pattern hasn't been studied as well as the tropics to temperate comparison. That's been studied and you know, a lot of work has been done on that, a lot of discussion on, on by ecologists of that. Less, much less so about the two oceans, in part because it's more of a marine problem as opposed to a general ecological problem. Um, another um, co uh, uh, com complication is that we always have to be careful about, are we talking about uh, rather uh, localized problems that are, uh, and things that are occurring over even year time scale um, versus something that we're talking about oceans. Um, and so there's some of the, the uh, explanations, for example, that are talked about uh, by Krebs um, for example, the uh, impact of predation on diversity. We're going to talk uh, about that um, later when we talk about um, rocky tidal pools and about the importance of predation by a starfish in promoting diversity. Um, it's a little bit harder for me to see how that works for talking about big scale differences over geological times. Um, so that's another complication when we talk about um, diversity and, and bio. Uh, bio uh, 
biogeographic bio patterns. So to sum up, we're going to be hitting many of these um, hypotheses again when we talk about specific environments. And so we'll revisit um, these ideas about what explains the patterns in diversity between the two oceans and between the tropics and Pacific uh, in upcoming lectures. And with that, we'll quit and um, I'll see you on Tuesday. Figure out how to stop this thing. I thought that stopped it. <laughs>